People always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right, this week's podcast, um, we have a buddy of mine on here. Um, We met on social media. We've actually never met in person, although I feel like I've known him for years now. He was, is a fan of our reality television show, and that's how we originally met. He was um, writing me emails, telling me I like this week's episodes, or asking me questions about different things. Uh, We've become friends over the years. We're happy to have him on our podcast tonight. He is the world's smallest magician. Erwin Royce. What's up, buddy? Hello there. How's it going? We're doing good, man. Uh, so happy to have you on here tonight. Uh, thank you for doing this with us. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it should be a lot of fun. So, uh, 47 seconds into the podcast, I have to ask. Um, let's get it out of the way. How tall are you? Four foot three. Four foot three. And what is your, yeah. what is your wife's height? Uh... Five three. He's four three. His wife is five three. I'm five five. Natalie's five ten. How close are we? Pretty darn close. Pretty darn close. Uh, we're about I, the, I, always, I always say there's a foot between us, and if I ever find out whose foot it is, I'll kill him. <laughs> All right. So, uh, can you tell my listeners the uh, world's smallest magician story? You said uh, you actually have it where you are the world's smallest magician. Well, back, I, besides doing magic, I uh, worked in the circus for two years as a clown. And uh, uh, we had a guy in New Orleans that was a little person, and he worked as the world's smallest magician. And then I came along, and uh, we would go back and forth with each other. And uh, we were getting free newspaper advertisement out of it. Uh, we played it that way. So, uh, circus came to town. So it was a fun show. rivalry. It wasn't anything. Oh no, it was a fun rivalry. Okay, okay. Yes. And um, uh, uh, Philip Morris was in town, the uh, costume who passed away not too long ago, and um, he got us out in the center ring in the middle of the show and measured us. And Joe was a. Uh, inch shorter I, a dollar I'm sorry dollar so I kept the title as world's smallest magician now in my 56 plus years of performing I haven't had anyone come forward and tell me that they were they knew somebody who was shorter than I was wow but I do believe there's a little guy and I think he's in Spain there's a show in your full dress tails and I, I don't know if he's still working but it was a guy I think is shorter than I am but you know it's all good publicity and um, if you've got a second I'll tell you why um, I'm ready back in uh, the 70s and 80s uh, there was this restaurant that opened up and it had a stage and at night, late, they'd have a country and western band. And a friend of mine said, you need to go out there and tell these guys uh, you're a magician. They have nothing out there for children. And um, so I did. And I did uh, rising cards out of a glass. And the guy said, you're hired. I'll, I'll give you $50 a night. It's Friday and Saturday. Uh, first half hour, you do balloon animals around the tables and then... The next 45 minutes, we did a show on stage. So um, I had some friends that worked with the radio station, and I contacted them, and they said, yeah, we're working, and we'll get you some free publicity. And they said, Erwin Roy's world's smallest magician. Well, at night, opening night, uh, about 6.30, the doors started opening. The guy had more business than he could handle on Friday and Saturday. And a lot of people came, enjoyed the show, and came back. A lot of people came 
enjoyed the show, but came to see how small the world's smallest magician was. Wow. And uh, I was there for 12 years. And so, um, you know, and so I'm sure somewhere, you know, uh, there's someone, but until that person proves me wrong, I'll use it. Well, that's that's awesome. That gets them in the door, man. What a what a great hook that if they just come there for curiosity and stay for the show, that's fine. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets them in the door, man. Yeah, we've had people come back every weekend, and um, uh, it got to the point where I had to learn to use my patter and work off the kids as much as possible. So I wasn't doing fifteen tricks a show. You know, right? And uh, I hate the hate the word tricks. Magic effects a show, and um, you know, and I was just wearing myself out. I was just buying, buying, but not making, making. Yeah. And uh, you know, you take the uh, magicians who know what I'm talking about. You take the crystal silk cylinder, and Christmas time, you wrap it with Christmas paper. You know, you got a new trick. It looks brand yeah. new. Yeah. And the kids don't recognize it. And you do a different routine with it, and you're done. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the hard part, but that's where you become an entertainer. Now you learn to milk routines and not stretch them out. We were talking to another friend a couple of days ago about, you know, one of his pet peeves is somebody saying that they can do 15 minutes, but they only have, you know, two tricks and really they should have done, you know, 10 tricks in that 15 minutes because all they did was just stretch it out and it was so stretched out. It was boring. Um, yeah, it's important. But there is a there is a fine line of you know you want to stretch them out, and the more you can stretch them out, and the more you can have fun, and do that well, yeah, you'll have more routines that last you, and you can do more stuff in the show. So yeah, that, and when people call awesome. for a show, I always say thirty to forty five minutes. I right. never give them an exact time. Well, and you you never know, and and. You know, kids getting up, running around, drinks getting spilled at shows, you know, especially kids' shows. Drinks getting spilled, you know, kids throwing up, you know, potty breaks. The birthday kid has to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the show. Well, the show doesn't go on with the birthday kid not there. The show is paused. So I had a, I had a little boy jump up and down one day and uh, uh, have all these things written down uh, for future use. And uh, I, he jumped up and he said, wait, 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 I got to pee. <laughs> yeah. And we just took a break. The show is just on hold, and now we all just look at each other. I've been there. We've been there. You've seen that before, yeah, haven't you, Natalie? Yeah. It's an awkward <laughs> silence. <laughs> and then he comes back so quickly, and everybody's thinking, did he wash his hands? He was just <laughs> was too quick. <laughs> um, so how did you get started in magic? How did it all get started for you? Well, I mentioned earlier that I have osteogenesis imperfecta. And for anybody who does not know, it's basically brittle bones. I break easy. Um, and as you get older, no pun intended for me, you kind of grow out of it. And um, so when I was born, the doctor gave me five days to live. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm now 73 and still working. So... Um, um, I was born with a broken arm, and um, and if I get a book together, it, my title's going to be my first break into show business. Wow. And, you know, and so I've had over 160 breaks in my lifetime. Oh, my goodness. That's as many as we could count, you know. It could be more. I don't know. And, uh, you know, right now, anything... That happens is usually, you know, if you have need an operation, I, I have a plate in each femur, you know, and, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could have quit right there, but my mother was always the type that said, uh, uh, you have something for a reason, you know, so, uh, uh, and my magic was always junk. Why are you buying that junk? And the first day my picture appeared in the newspaper, it wasn't junk anymore. Um, my mother never always carried to slip a newspaper around with her, you know. That so awesome. uh, it was a long road, and uh, we're still doing it. And uh, 
uh, I enjoy every minute. Like I said, with the pandemic going on, uh, it's just uh, everybody's just sitting home and uh, 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 cases are on the rise now all around the United States. And uh, we really don't have any outside places, you know, like campgrounds and things like that where we could do shows. Um, but I did get a call for an indoor birthday party, you know. And, and now being summer, uh, winter time, you know, all parties can probably be indoors or at venues. And I really don't want to take a chance at uh, 73, you know, going out and catching COVID, you know. Yeah. So you, you were laid up. Is that how you got your first magic book or your mom or somebody bought you a trick? You were laid up with a broken arm? Well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, you, that was the question. I got off on a No, jam. you're good. You're good. No, I'm, I'm following oh, yeah. I, um, A friend of mine, I was in the hospital, and uh, we had a magician come up and do a magic show for everybody. And um, I, had, I always loved magic. I always loved circus. And uh, I, the guy said, look, that, he got me up there and he did rope through the waist on me. And, um, uh, and then I said, you know, I got some magic tricks. And I had my little cigar box with magic tricks in them. And I showed it to him. And uh, uh, he's, you know, and I was like 13, 14. And he said, you know, we have a magic club called Crescent City Magicians. He said, why don't, why don't you get your dad to bring you? So I get to this old house off of St. Charles Avenue. And um, I mean, really old house. And I go in and all of these magicians have to be like in their 60s, you know. And uh, it was just all of this... Um, uh, education of absorb you know and uh, i i started doing birthday parties my first birthday party i did as a clown i will never do that again because when you're the same size as a eight-year-old nine-year-old um you don't want to walk in with clown makeup on because immediately it's jump on his feet pull his nose you know pull his hair off yeah so uh, that's where it came in i said you know i'm just going as a world's smallest magician and that's where it took off, you know. But you did clowning in the circus. Yes, I did that. And that came about, uh, you know, I, I've had somebody looking over me all this time. Uh, we had a gentleman who did a television show called The Sunday Journal. And he had these uh, touching stories and things like this. And I wrote him and I said, you know, I've always wanted to work the circus. I said, around Thanksgiving time, the circus comes to New Orleans. I said, you need to get in there with a film crew and watch them set the auditorium up from nothing until the finished product. People would be amazed. And he says, well, why do you have such interest? And I explained, I've always wanted to join. He said, I got an idea for a story. And we went down there, talked to the owner, talked to two clowns, Walter and Mildred Stymax, who were both boss clowns. And actually, the only clowns in the show at that time. And um, they said, you know, why don't you have him come in, do your story. And um, so the guy said, look, I'm going to put the camera on you, and I want you to hold on to that rope. And I want you to just kind of look like you're dreaming, you know, know, at play acting, you know, to make the story heartfelt. But he didn't really know how heartfelt I was, you know. And uh, so we did that, and the two clowns said, uh, why don't you bring the film crew back tonight, and we'll put this little guy in the show. And, you know, I had to hold myself down for floating away, you know. Wow. So uh, they, gave me a, they gave me a new face, completely white face, and um, uh, then I was using and uh, went in that night, and we did a bit. And uh, another bit, and then they said, you know what? You want to come back the rest of the week? We can't pay you, but you can come back to the rest of the week. And I said, sure, you know. So, uh, How old were you at this point? Oh, gosh. This was, I 
had to take time off from the restaurant gig, so okay. I had to be well. I had to be I had to be in my twenties, I would guess, early twenties, and um, this was later after the restaurant. I'm sorry. Was this and, a national uh, touring circus, or is this a local thing? Well, actually, people think it's it's local. It's called the Shrine Circus. Oh, okay, okay. But you know, the Shrine Circus is not the Shrine Circus. It's only sponsored by the Shrine. It actually has a name, like Hannaford, Walinda, okay. Carson Barnes. So I worked uh, one year for Tommy Hannaford, and the following year I worked for Carl Walinda, Flying Walindas. Wow. And um, and we had the same boss clowns. That's they called me and said, "Look, we're coming your way," you know. And uh, he said, "After the show, we want to go to Bourbon Street and get drunk," you know. And I said, "Well, I was always the type of guy I don't drink, and uh, I would always uh, make sure my props were brought home before I'd go to a party or anything like that. I was very careful with my props because I knew how much they cost." And uh, I got a college degree in uh, commercial art and couldn't get a job. And uh, go to a sign, a sign shop to do this. And the guy says, look, he says, I, I need somebody who can sketch in the shop. He says, but if they need a, something on the side of a building, I don't have anybody to send out. I would have to hire two people to pay for one. And uh, so the circus uh, was a learning lesson. I mean, here I am with osteogenesis and perfected brittle bones, and I'm being chased, uh, you know, by these two big clowns. And uh, I'm going, in the back of my head, I go, if I fall, it's over with, you know. And, uh, and I also said, oh, what a way to go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know. So we're doing a gag one night, and the girl says, all you have to do is grab this folding chair, she says, and run like heck, she says. And, you know, so I am grabbed the chair up to the bit, the clowns run out, and they start to black out, and I look forward to coming up the ramp at the auditorium. It's Tommy Hanna for Taurus's. Oh, no. It costs us. Now, I jumped a two-foot ring curb. Okay, uh, my legs aren't that long to start with, you know, and um, went back that night and tried to do it again and couldn't do it. Oh. It's amazing what a bunch of horses and adrenaline will do. I thought you were going to say that these things trampled you and that was the end of your circus no, career. No, no, I made it over and um, the the lady clown, uh, uh, she had trips. She went under the bandstand and... Uh, but it was it was a learning experience. One night they blacked out, and somebody miscued, and I came out and my shirt was torn, and I thought it was a kid that grabbed me. It was a chimpanzee. Oh my! And uh, uh, chimpanzees, when chimpanzees come in, most clowns will go the other way, and uh, I always wondered why. And uh, a chimp had killed a clown once. Uh, it's something in their makeup uh, um. that that brings them back instinct in the makeup because the natives in the jungles wore makeup. That is so and, interesting. Uh, yeah. And that thing would have thrown you like a rag doll. And, uh, but he just reached out and they weren't supposed to be coming in that way and I just, thank God, he had blacked out. They black out between each you know, wow. but we had to stay in makeup. People think clowns are just there to be funny. We had to stay in makeup all night till the show was over in case something happened. We had to go in Phil. and keep the audience busy. Yeah. So, uh, and then we had to get up like at six o'clock on Saturday and go to hospitals. So you guys are the hardest work. working. Yeah, it's rough work. It really is. Anybody tells you it's easy. You know, it's not. Now, with uh, the Flying Walindas, did you get to see them, or were they already retired by the time you went to work with them? No, 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 no. I, uh, 
I uh, unfortunately saw Carl fall, oh. and uh, he fell in Puerto Rico at the time. It was, and uh, it, it was quite distressing. Uh, uh, a gust of wind came up, and you can you can still see it on probably YouTube if you want to. But uh, a gust of wind came up, and you could hear Ricky. You know, I don't know if you remember. Not too long ago, a guy walked across the Grand Canyon. Yeah, I remember. I remember the commercials for it are saying you yeah, have to be with, a CBS or Rick, something. I worked with Ricky when Ricky was thirteen, and now he was grown up and he's doing. Well, anyway, Ricky was on the other side of the building, and he was yelling. The wind came up, and Carl kind of wobbled, and it was like you could hear Ricky yelling. Papa, sit down. Papa, sit down. And instead of Carl sitting down, he tried to control that big, heavy pole. And um, and it caught him off balance. And when he went down, he tried to grab, but he was too old and fragile, you know. And But Carl always said, if I'm going to go, that's the way I want to go. So is that how he went? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know the story. You saw him die that night. Well, he fell and he hit the back of a cab. This was daytime. Oh, he was, up, he was almost finished the walk, and uh, uh, that's why I watch squeamishly when I see Ricky do those things, and you know people do those things. So, uh, and I lost another very good friend. I wasn't there that night, but uh, uh, we worked on. We get these little gigs. I don't know if you get them. You do school shows, and at night they have a show in the auditorium. And you do a one-nighter, maybe for five days. And uh, we had a, a Uncle Heavy's pig act. And, uh, uh, you know, diff- uh, we had the unicycle act. Well, uh, this gentleman uh, shows you how life can throw you a twist. Uh, this gentleman worked unicycles with his two kids. And then he worked... Uh, trampoline and a high wire Spike did a high wire act and um, I don't know if he's alive today but he's uh, last I heard he was selling garage door openers you know wow well sorry if you hear a squeak in here the kids were crying in the other room so Natalie's That's bobbing right. both babies they're chirping here. That's a good noise That's so, a good noise I mean. yeah she's uh, she's taking care of them but they're uh, yeah. Almost, uh, but, uh, almost two months old, and they're they're making little meep, meep, meep noises on the microphone here. So sorry about that. I, I like that picture you posted uh, uh, not too long ago. Mom was looking directly at the camera. Yeah, and hugging the brother. Is that the one? Yeah, and yeah. Said, there's the uh, yeah, there's the performer right there. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I got to figure out which one that is. We'll promote him. We'll we'll move him up a little bit. But what what I was alluding to was the fact that they they blacked out too soon and Cindy was not to where she was into the wire where she could grab on and they blacked off and Cindy fell oh. yeah. instant instant death uh, and uh, yeah, I hate just to be so gross I mean this, this no you this know when I, was, when I was growing up at the magic shop I used to say um, wow what a, what a way to go you, you, you're going out doing what you love and then I saw a YouTube video of Tommy Cooper having a heart attack on stage at the, I think it was the Palladium or something. It was uh, in, in London. And since he was a comedy magician, he collapsed and he's mumbling to himself. He's having a heart attack. I mean, they just laughed and laughed and the audience was just roaring in laughter. And his assistant thought he was just being silly. And the curtain closed on him and then they went to commercial and he was gone. And I was yeah, like, yeah. "That's there's nothing cool about dying on stage. It's mm-hmm. just no." It, but when well, you're a kid, died, you're like, "Man, that's a cool way to go." I've died on stage many nights, you know, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's different. That's different. That's that's yeah, doable. Uh, that's okay. You can overcome that. Yeah. A couple of years ago, not too long ago, I, I have problems with my spine and my neck now from the osteo, and um, I uh, I had a pinched nerve, and I was doing a uh, preschool. And uh, I was at a pinched nerve in my neck, and I could hear the words coming out of my mouth, but I didn't know what I was saying. 
Oh, uh, wow. And uh, the kids are laughing, you know, ho, ho, ha, 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 ha. And, uh, you know, the guy's making funny faces. And uh, I got through it, and uh, the principal came over the school who, it's at, it's our church, so uh, she says, are you okay? And uh, she said, I've seen your show before, and she says, the kids loved it, but I know that some things you did didn't jive with what you were doing. And uh, I got from the chair, because now I do my show sitting down in the chair, and I got on the mobility scooter, and uh, Sorry. <laughs> I heard a uh, I got on the, the mobility scooter, and everything went away. It was fine. And, wow. uh, it just got some blood flow when you moved a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I just, uh, called my doctor and he said, go to the emergency room. And I went to the emergency room and it, we said, Hey, it might be a pinched nerve, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, but, uh, you know, it's, I have done thing, you know, real quickly, osteogenesis comes in different forms. Osteogenesis can be very severe. I have a friend that lives in the parish I live in who's only like three foot tall. And if the dog licks him on the foot, he'll break, break something. Um, now, I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to this. I don't know. When a yes. bone breaks, it still hurts the same as if a person with strong bones? Or is it yes. different? You don't know you break it. Or it... Oh, no, you know you break it. It's oh, just as bad. Yeah. It's just as bad. Golly. Yeah, and uh, and there are other people who are average height that uh, have osteogenesis, but they have it so mild. Now, I'm kind of in between, and I don't have dwarfism. I'm not a dwarf, uh, as the picture will show when I be sitting on the thing with my wife hitting me with the wand. Um, I... I I'm equally proportioned. Unlike if you took an adult and shrunk him down to four foot three, you know. Right, right. So, um, uh, uh, dwarfism, dwarfs have short fingers, and those are the type, those are the people who you normally, people associate with circus for some reason. I don't know why. Huh. And, uh, yeah, I just don't understand it. But, um, you know, but, I mean, I have, I don't know if I've done anything in my lifetime that I feel I missed, you know? Dude, that's that's a great accomplishment. That's, that's yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I tell people, um, you know, you see, when I was doing my 12-year gig, I didn't go to conventions. I had to be there working. Yeah. So a lot of these new guys today, like, oh, like, for yourself. You didn't know I existed until we met online. Right. No, I had no idea. And so if I were to say, hey, I'd like to come to a convention, you know, all you have to have is have the state, the, the hotel put up one of these elevators or have them put up a, a ramp. Big deal, you know. And uh, they kind of shy away because, um, you know, they don't want to be, I guess, feel responsible for anybody. But uh, uh, now, I got a great assistant. She standing behind me with a knife, and uh, <laughs> now I can I can go off and talk to the client and come back to show set up. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, Natalie's the same way. Yeah, you know, and um, and sometimes I'll throw a curb, not meaning to do it. Uh, I have a list of what we're doing. And she has the list and I'll skip a trick because I totally forgot it and she'll have to hurry up and get something else ready, you know. Yeah. So uh, uh, she's good at that. But uh, uh, my lovely bride is taking up tap dancing. And she's obsessed with Fred Astaire. Yes, obsessed with Fred Astaire. On the wall is Freddie's picture. Freddie has a um, 22 by 28 poster up on the wall. Wow. And I have 11 by 17. Isn't that funny that, um, that she, I mean, it, 
she's so attracted to Fred Astaire and loves his dancing. But it has uh, nothing. You, you don't ever ask her. It has anything to do with those long legs of his, do, do you? No, no. <laughs> no. You know what it is? My wife is an old soul, and she likes old movies, old music. Now, there's a big difference in our ages. Okay. I'm with uh, you. Uh, yeah. She she lived here until she was six years old. Her family moved to Georgia. And then one night in a little people's group, she would get in a little people's group and talk to the little people and help them out as best she could. And um, she said, my, my email was magicwsm at aol.com. And uh, so she said, asked me if I was a magician. And her, she had gone to Vegas to visit her uncle who would set up all the alcohol and stuff at bring it all to the casinos. And uh, uh, he took her and bought her some magic tricks and stuff like that. So uh, she says, we're coming down. We're coming down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. I said, not Mardi Gras Day. No, we're coming down the weekend before. And uh, so she says, can we meet? And I said, well, I don't go out. I had enough of Mardi Gras. Not that I don't appreciate what my parents did. My parents took me to parades. They put me in a wagon with a cast on, you know, from my waist waist to my feet. And they took me to parades. I didn't miss anything. And uh, so she would take and uh, so she said, we'll meet you at the Cafe du Monde. I said, wait a minute. I'm not going to get in an argument with a policeman. I said, I will try if I can't. Then I tell you what, I'll go home, and when you all get home, call me or catch me online. I go over to a little parking lot, a little strip mall, and there's like a a, a jewelry shop, a bookstore, a Cafe Du Monde, and people are bumper to bumper. There's one parking spot left. Guess where it is? Right next to her. Where I was supposed to meet her. One spot left. So was it meant to be? Yes. I I think it all is. I think it's all, everything, everything happens for a reason. It's, it's a, it's a theme with my podcast, it seems like, and it's a theme with life. Uh, And I tell people, you know. Uh, even if it's a you know big negative thing that happens, it happens for a reason. It might take you twenty years to look back on it, but you'll 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 figure it out. You might not figure it out today or tomorrow, but give it twenty years. Look back. So um, my wife is. Let me let me drop it on you. My wife's thirty nine and I'm seventy three. If it works, it works, man. That's all that really matters. Well, I usually get more silence than that. No, no, I hate. No, Natalie and I are six years apart, but I mean, it wouldn't matter. Natalie is. You know, with these two twins and her, I mean, in this podcast right now, she's gotten up like six times, ran to the other room to comfort the babies. I'm holding the baby right now. She's holding the baby in the other hand. I put it in my newsletter. She hasn't even read my newsletter this month yet. She's like a Wonder Woman, man. She keeps the house done. She she homeschools yeah. my daughter. She does my show. She's the one that sets up my props. She books the shows. She does everything. So, yeah. And I mean, this, is, this is my second wife. Um, and um, you won't talk about the first one, but uh, uh, we had a poodle act too in the show. We had three poodles. And uh, so uh, we took on a lot. Uh, now we've got an old poodle, and she's blind. And uh, Stephanie gives her a medicine, gives her her shots and stuff like that. Wow. She's part of the family. She'll be here. But uh, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent again here. But, uh, you know, there's so much to tell. We could probably do double podcasts. Oh, we could do we could do six podcasts. I, I have so much to ask you and so much to talk about. But you I was to talking. Ask me something. Say it again. You were going to ask me something about. Well, Zoom. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, telling him that you were going to be on here. And I said, you know. Have you been listening to the podcast? He's been a fan of the podcast, and he'll he'll fill me in on what he thought was really interesting in the last podcast. And it's good to have outside views come in. And I said, well, I'm having the world's smallest magician on my podcast. And I said, you know, you know what's really cool about him though? 
besides everything, uh, you also have the memory factor, the lasting memory factor where these kids will remember you. You know, they say we're jaded because we see so much magic and we see somebody do like a, a silken egg or, or linking, um, linking rings. And we're like, oh, everybody does that. But to an audience, you go out there and do those tricks. They've never seen those before. Well, magnify that as a little person doing magic. Whoa. Yeah. They'll never forget that dude. So that's that's yeah. awesome. I have adults that come up to me in Walmart a lot and go, uh, I want to introduce you to this man. He did grandma's birthday, a mama's birthday party when she was 12. And I'm going, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. wow! But like they remember really, you, man. I mean, it stands out. You're, you're, yeah. That's that's an awesome. Besides having the world's smallest magician moniker, I mean, you got that. You you are the world's smallest magician. You're memorable right from the get go before you've even done a single trick. Yeah. But yeah. they expect more out of you too. Um, yeah, yeah, but you you and, come through. But when I do my school shows, I never close the curtain. I have an intro, but I never close the curtain. When the kids come in, I'm sitting on a chair. I want them to have time to come in and see the world's smallest magician and get all of these oohs, ahs, giggles, smirks, and also to look at all these shiny props because when the announcement goes on, they're in your mind, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, but you did ask me something about the zoo, and I wanted to touch on that because I get that question a lot. Well, it was so, uh, yeah, I got a whole list of questions here. Um, you told me a fascinating history about um, little people as, like, token treasures for kings, and I was dumbfounded. I never heard of anything like that. What was that story? Yeah, I had searched it uh, on Winnipegia, and um, uh, I had... I did a Google search, and then, then somebody lectured at a Little People's Convention. And uh, uh, naturally, they they needed jesters, you know, uh, people to clean up after the king and queen. Uh, and uh, I guess they quite thought it funny that, oh, look, you know, I'll trade you this little person you know, for a horse, you know, he's funny. He can jump around and giggle and everything. And, uh, uh, apparently it is true. And, uh, he's like a real so, person, just littler. Can you yeah, imagine? Can you imagine what they would say? Yeah. Didn't look at it back then like that. Yeah. You know, it's the same way with sideshow. People don't look at it that way. Uh, you know, well, uh, they're, they're uh, to entertain us. And well, they do. Go ahead. Nope. Oh. They, so as far as, uh, you told me a story about your, your Vegas trip where you had an all expense paid trip to Vegas just to do one line in a show. No, okay, but the Vegas show was a, a company show and I was there for four days. Okay. Uh, I was dressed as a leprechaun and I was in the booth that people, the company I work for, they did advertisement for potatoes. In other words, you don't think about it like that, but if you want to contact this company and say, hey, I got a great bunch of sweet potatoes from this stuff like apples, you know, you see all the apple commercials. And uh, so I was a leprechaun, and they, they gave me this beautiful room. That night the guys took me to see Siegfried and Roy, and, uh, you know, all of this stuff going on. And they didn't know I did magic. So I said, you know, I brought some magic with me. And the whole thing, I tried to explain to them. Some of these guys were young and green. And uh, I said, let me get their attention. Let me draw them in. And as I'm drawing them in, get behind them. So when they turn around, you're right there to shake hands with them and to give out your business cards and whatever. And they thought that was like better than ice cream. Wow. I mean, I could have worked for a company and made a fortune just on that idea that I thought everybody knew. 
Yeah. So I got in the booth and I started doing a balloon animal here and a split deck and uh, uh, stuff like that. And uh, I had to give away these little keychains, keychains with a clover in it. And in one day, we had to send off for more. We were out of them. We had that many people at the booth. They ran a full page article in the paper that said, please don't step on our leprechaun. Uh, Which I thought was funny. Wow, that's that's uh, awesome. uh, But my room was on one side of the casino. The hotel and meeting room and where the convention was, was on the opposite. So the shortest way for these little legs to go was straight through the one-armed bandits, you know. Dressed as a leprechaun? Yeah. <laughs> was everybody wanting to touch you for good luck on the one arm band? Exactly. exactly. Yes. Wow. Everybody wanted to touch me, and I said, I don't guarantee anything, you know. And, uh, but in case you win and you want to split, you know. <laughs> there you go. Make the best of it. Well, but I did that. I did that in Vegas, and, um, what was the other thing you asked me about? I'm sorry. No, you had a different story about you. They sent you all the way to Vegas and put you up, and you did all this great stuff. And you had a line. Was it a tobacco calling Philip Morris or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. I went to uh, the Vegas story was the leprechaun. I went to uh, where I met Philip Morris, the guy who runs the costume shop at the time. And um, I, I went to Calabaris County, North Carolina. They picked me up at the airport. They brought me into this great big warehouse, and there's this big train. I mean, a real train sitting there. And they put me up in a box car that looked like the guys from the Wild Wild West. It was all red velvet and everything. I had my own porter. And they said, uh, we're going to pick you up at the train. We're going to take you to the shop, get you in the costume. Um, and uh, I was the last of the Philip Morris Bell Boys. Now, people who don't know, after they listen to the podcast, can go to YouTube. They won't see me, because I was only one night. Uh, they can see the Philip Morris commercial. And but it always ended with, I started with, call for Philip Morris, and uh, who was the cigarette maker. And I was a little bit against it, but being smoking in that because I never smoked I didn't have to smoke and uh, so we came back to the train car I met a gentleman by the name of Ward Hall who built most of the amusement parks at the time and he said that's your train car for the night he said sleep well we'll pick you up tomorrow he said we're gonna put you in this room and keep you away from the press and they all know you, Little Johnny. It was the character's name. And they all know Little Johnny is coming. And we don't want to keep want to keep you to the end. So there's press there from all over the Carolinas. And uh, they get, uh, the guy says, oh, look, we've got a big box on stage. And the front looks like a cigarette pack. And he says, and when I call your name and introduce you, You just bust out of that box and give us that Philip Morris yell. And I said, okay, wait, wait, got some questions. How much bass is in front of that box? Which will let me know how much busting I'm going to do. Right. That's kind of important. End up in the audience. All right, I'll just trip it. Yeah, you know, and uh, so never did the call. Never did it. And uh, didn't even try to practice it. And I popped out of this paper box and was totally blinded by flash bulbs and lights and everything. And I did call for Philip Morris. And kind of thinking on my feet, I said, I tell you what, let's everybody in this building, we'll knock the top of this roof off. We're all going to do it together. Now, you had thousands of people in this building yelling call for Philip Morris. So I get back to... uh, I get back to the, uh, they all huddle around me. You know, I felt like Elvis or something. And uh, they get back to the thing and they let the press in. First question out of the guy's mouth. I I work for such and such a tribune. Uh, What do you think about 
Philip Morris making fun of your size. See, there's always one in a bunch. Wow. And I said, oh, actually, I think it's an honor. I said, uh, there's only been so many little Johnnies, I said, and uh, uh, I said, it's, it's an absolute honor to do this. And I said, and if I, it bothered me, I wouldn't have took the trip from New Orleans. And um, next morning was on a plane back to New Orleans to do my Saturday night show. And uh, so while I'm signing, can you stay for autographs? Okay. I had to sign the little Johnny. I don't know how many times I felt like I was doing punch work, you know, right on the chalkboard. This lady came over and she had tears running down her eyes. And she said, little Johnny, she says, would you autograph my eyeglass case? She says, I don't have any paper. She said, you don't remember this, little Johnny. She says, but like 20 years ago, you came to our town and my mom was sick and she couldn't come and see you and she loved you. After the thing was over with, you came to our house and you came upstairs and visited my mother. Now, that'll give you an idea on nostalgia. You know, it's still around today. Wow. But, um, you know. And that woman just saw a different little person in the same outfit and just knew it was you. And the call was right. Everything was just right. Had to be the same guy. Because little Johnny was not a, quote, little person not anybody with dwarfism he was actually probably a little taller than i was and uh, uh they had the costume ready and you know took take up a hem here a hem there and i was back to the shop for final fitting and we were off and i'm riding down this highway and i call my wife my ex at the time and i said guess where i'm calling from she says where i'm doing the laundry <laughs> said, I'm calling you from a white Cadillac. Wow. And uh, uh, the guys were laughing at it because she said, you should be ashamed of yourself, you know. She's home doing the laundry and you're riding in a white Cadillac. And I said, but you all didn't give me any more money. You know, I'd have brought it with me. <laughs> but uh, That'll shut them up know. quick. Yep. And, uh, but it's been a fun ride, you know. Wow. Uh, I hate when people say, are you normal size? You see, there is no normal. Um, there's average, right. but there's no normal. What's the, what's you know, the average, what's the average of a little person? Well, there's no, there's no average dwarfism. There's really no average on dwarfism. Uh, but, um, uh, four foot of the what they what they got it down to is if you're under four foot eleven, if you're four foot eleven or under, you can join the little people of America. Okay, there you go. Okay, yeah, but they'll come over and you know, and and you get you get the screwballs. I had a guy walk up to me one time and said, "Hey, look at him. He's standing in a hole." Yeah, and uh, I get bullied today, man. I go to the mall with my wife, and these. Punks, uh, I hear it, but in today's world, you don't turn around and say anything. Yeah. You know, because you get blown away, you know. So uh, you just suck it up and as their stupidity. And that's where my wife comes in, because she stopped me many times from saying something to somebody, you know. Yeah, that's, that's horrible. Oh, you go down in the mall and you're walking down the mall and here's this woman coming along with a kid and she's pulling the kid's arm out the socket. And as she passes, she's going, little Henry, look at the little midget. I mean, the kid, the kid took me for what I was, a little person, the yeah. mother, grown up woman. And we're going to pull out the socket going, look at the little midget. That's just, so, uh, that's just great parenting is what that is. Uh-huh. Yep. Well, the thing is, you know, the word, that word, we're trying to get that word uh, changed in the vocabulary. Not taken out, but changed. Mm-hmm. And uh, changed in the sense that when you're talking about a human being, 
uh, it can be a hurtful word. Yeah, my kid agrees. Um, yeah, that's like but, my story. But right now, you, um, you're you doing a lot of volunteers. They'll be bigger than I'm at. I am. They'll be wearing my clothes. You think so? Which win? Yeah. Yeah, well. And yeah, thank yeah. you again for those uh, T-shirts you gave us. Man, they were awesome. He gave us a top hat and wand uh, T-shirts for the boys. I love them. Yeah. So awesome. I wait for those pictures when they fit. As soon as oh, they grow absolutely. into them. absolutely. Yes. Um, and, and before we have to go off, uh, if we're running too long, I want to get to the zoo thing. I'm, I'm going to the zoo right now, man. So okay. how long have you been working at the zoo? Uh, we're at the zoo 14 years. And you and your wife volunteer there? Yes. Yes. My so, wife and I both. So and, uh, I, uh, I fell in love with uh, you all over again because I knew you were the world's smallest magician. I saw you do videos. I brought Lana um, and set Lana down on the couch one day and watched you do a couple magic tricks in your driveway. And it was just awesome. I, I loved how you put a spin on things. It was great magic. Great children's magic. It was it was it was great magic, but you were doing a children's theme trick. But um and then you volunteered at the at the zoo and you just went live a couple days. I don't know if it was Sundays or what. And you just took your scooter around the zoo and just talked to the different animals and called them by name. And you, it so much love. And I told Natalie, I said, Look, the world's smallest magician, because she didn't know your name at the time. I said, if we're ever in Louisiana, I'm going to go hang out with this dude. I want to go see the zoo. I want to hang out with him because this is awesome. Yeah, the zoo, you know, we go to, people don't think the volunteers just don't go out there and walk around dopey. We have to buy a uniform. Uh, uh, we get a free shirt. Uh, but we have to take classes. And we learn about every animal in the zoo. So somebody comes up and says to you, you know, a question you, you pretty much got to think off the top of your head if there is an answer and uh, you know uh, for instance alluding to your next question a lady stand I work by elephants I'm, I'm elephant outlook it's way up in the air and people pass by and they can see the elephants lady's sitting there and she's looking at these elephants and she came comes over by me and she says that's sad, you know, that these animals need to be in the wild. And I said, uh, ma'am, these animals were born and bred in captivity. They wouldn't last in the wild an hour. You know? Yeah. And people think that zoos go out and capture animals from the wild and bring them back to a zoo. It's not the way. We just had uh, two boy lion cubs born not too long ago and when they get big enough and they're able to breed we'll send them to another zoo that's looking for them and, now, and we, you know, we swap animals but now is yours also a research so they're finding out more about these guys and and learning how to control their habitats and learning about the animals at your zoo they're not just on display. Most zoos are doing some kind of research. and Yeah. And we have different... Uh, down here, we have the aquarium. Uh, we have the bug museum. A bug, uh, whatever you want to call it. And um, uh, there's always... There's a, a, a group that takes the, just the turtles out of... It that have been injured uh, by boats, by propellers. And they pre repair their shells... They take pelicans that uh, are injured, fix their wings, and if they can, go back out into the environment safely, then they let them go. If they can't, what are they going to do with them? Put them to sleep? They can give them a happy home in a, a zoo or something somewhere. Wow, yeah. and people. Just, so we're not the bad guys, you know? People just look at it. And they just want to put a negative connotation on anything they don't understand. And if exactly. they just do two seconds of research, they'd understand all the good that zoos do educating people. I mean, because you're not going to be able to get that close to an elephant. It's not safe to get that close to an elephant in the wild. No. But, I mean, it, and the stuff that you guys are doing and the research and the work that you're doing and the love that you have. If they just and see that think, alone, yeah, you I think, think it would change their if, tone. Uh, you think that if... Um, this were not happening, 
uh, when your daughter grows up, uh, if she has children, uh, they may never know what an elephant looks like or smells like. Right. Well, I watched, I watched online the last elephant leave Ringling Brothers. It was live online. The last elephant walked out of Ringling Brothers, and I'm sitting here and I'm crying like a baby. Well, there was a there was a, a lady that worked with the Ringling Brothers animals, and she said they're put into a um, an enclosure, a high fence enclosure, and they're being set quote unquote back into the wild, which means they don't get vet care anymore. They get food, but they don't get vet care anymore. So they're getting hoof and mouth disease, and they're getting illnesses, and nobody's looking after them anymore. And it's just sad. It's it's awful. And that's they have that's a, not what should happen no, to these animals. Place. They have a place in Florida. Ringling has a, 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 a where they keep any cabs, when I say cabs, I mean tigers and lions and then uh, uh, elephants. And they've been doing research with the elephants, not hurting the research, not hurting the animals, but uh, blood tests on the elephants and trying to find the cure. Was it for leukemia or something? Okay. And, uh, uh, but they just, uh, I mean, I miss it. I miss it. I mean, I. I go out there just to visit, you know, not allowed to go in, in my uniform, but we get in for free. So we, we probably go tomorrow and, um, you know, just to get my zoo fix, you know? Yeah. Well, but yeah, you're right. When people don't understand it, uh, they, they have to, you know, find some reason to make themselves believe things, you know? Yeah. It's, they don't want to be educated, but they have strong opinions, and it's like mm, that's 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 a bad way. You got to listen to both sides of the argument first. Yeah. Well, well we're running I'm out of time. I I need you to stay on the line because we're going to wrap things up. Thank you yeah, so me, much for me, being me, on here. Go ahead. If, if you give me a second or two, um, what I'm going to try to start doing is I'm trying to start doing um, anybody who wants to live stream their show or a live video of their show. Uh, and I have, the, I was asked to do this by none other than Bob Fitch, who's taught many, many, many entertainers, who I had the pleasure of working with years ago, helping a young magician. And uh, Bob said that I should, uh, um, you know, work with some magicians. And if they're willing to take criticism, you know, uh, give them some pointers on what to do and not to do. So if anybody's listening that uh, doesn't mind taking criticism because I don't hold any punches um, and we can work together on something and, you know, whatever it takes, uh, you know, just shoot me an email. What's, and, that, what's um, that email address? It's magic, W like William, S like Sam, M like Mary. It stands for World's Smallest Magician. At AOL.com. That's yeah, awesome. Still, still on AOL. Can you believe it? Uh, you're the only one. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Erwin. Stay on the line, man. We're going to wrap everything up. This was awesome. I have Take another care, 15, boy. 20 questions to talk to you about, but um, we'll do it again. I promise. All right, man. All Take right. care. Hold on one second, Love man. Off. Don't don't get Love off the line yet. No, uh, no. Tonight on Jewel TV, episode 9 is going to air. It's our Halloween episode. Um, it's on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, the Jewel TV app, and tons of other places. It's in over 100 million households. All you have to do is look for it. You'll find it. See you next week. Today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by Express Copy and Graphics. Mention promo code Wes Isley to get 10% off. Their website is expresscopy.com. That's X-P-R-E-S-S dash C-O-P-Y dot com. They do it all. Copies, banners, signs, vehicle wraps, promo items, practically anything you need printed, they can do it for you. These guys are great. Check them out. Check us out online at WesIsley.com and Patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind the scene videos, blooper videos, never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, Magic Trick Tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley, spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. -S -S -E